So again, my name is John Havacon. I'm uh, with the Eldorado Beekeepers. We're uh, a club up here that uh, a lot of amateur, but uh, some professional beekeepers also, and, and I'm fit in there somewhere. I'm not not quite professional, but I, I, I call myself a sideliner because I, I collect bees, but I get something from it. Um, for my farm, I have a lavender farm up in uh, Apple Hill, and so. I make chapstick with the bee beeswax and, and so that, and then I also get honey. So it's kind of a sideline business for me. It's not my main business, but um, so I'm kind of semi-professional semi with beekeeping. I have currently about 28 hives. I've got 20 acres up in Apple Hill. Um, and so uh, pl plenty to take care of the apple trees up there. And uh, I did have pumpkins at one time and it did amazing things when I, brought beehives in and that, that's kind of what started me into beekeeping is um, bringing them in to, to get more pumpkins and it did and made bigger pumpkins so uh, just bringing them in like that it's amazing what can happen and, uh, and just the whole pollination of things that, that they, they went after. So um, I learned quite a bit over I've had bees for about eight years and now I'm, I've got a lot of bees. So let's talk a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll just quickly do a little uh, talk about the anatomy of the bees. They are an insect, so they, all insects have a lot of the similar things, especially the flying ones are gonna have compound eyes. Bees actually have five eyes. So you have the, the big eyes that they hit, see, but there's three more eyes right in the center that they use for looking for color and, and um, different heat sensors and things like that. So um, they have that. Uh, a lot of flying insects have four wings. Um, and also they have what's called a honey crop. So they've got their throat, but they also have a little pouch down uh, kind of a separate straw that they, that's where they suck the nectar in and uh, store it so they can bring it back. Um, they have two baskets, look like little shopping baskets on their, their legs that they put the pollen in and fly it back. So they're, they're pretty much set up for doing what they need to do. So again, pretty typical of a, a, an insect. They have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Their legs come out of the thorax, the wings come out of, out of the thorax. Um, their stomach is actually in the abdomen area, and then the thorax also has their heart and lungs, and, and of course the head is the brain and the eyes. So, also, like all insects, they have a cocoon. You don't see the cocoon because that's inside the hive. But uh, like, just like a butterfly and a uh, praying mantis, they, they, they build cocoons also. So does a, a, a bee. They'll, they'll build their cocoon, but you, you won't quite see it. So this capped area here, that is what their cocoon is. So the, the, you see the, the eggs in there, the, that's the larvae. And they'll they'll do, form like that for a while, but uh, after about uh, a week or so, they'll start capping over and, and start developing within the cocoon. And then after 21 days, they come out. So a typical hive has about uh, a single box of bees has about 30,000 30, bees in it. So two boxes is about 60,000 bees. So if you see a single box out there, that, that's how many bees are out there. Like I say, I have 28 hives. So if somebody just looked up the number and it's like uh, 1.4. 1,444,000. <laughs> yeah, I didn't name them all either. They're, they're my pets, but. <laughs> So, uh, oh, let me go back. So 90% of the hive are worker bees. Um, worker bees are girl bees. 10% are boy bees. So um, the boys aren't used all that much other than to mate with the queen. Uh, otherwise, they're just kind of hanging around watching TV and, and <laughs> eating, eating things. So, so it, the, the one thing about hives is it is a woman's world. Uh, the guys don't have much to do with it. The women, women do all the work. Uh, kind of could be familiar with a lot of people already. Um, so um, their life cycle, they hatch. Um, 
the egg, and that stays for about three days, and then it gets into that cocoon stage where it's five days um, up to 13, or actually larval stage is where you see the, 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 the little egg or the person. Um, the pupa stage is the, the cocoon stage, and then from there they come out 21 days, and the first thing those women have to do is go back and clean their hive, clean their room. So um, that's their first task that they, they do. They, they start with cleaning a room and they start cleaning, cleaning the, hive, the rest of the cells in the hive. So, the, but they graduate, so that's not the first thing they do. After a few days, they go and they become feeding, feeding uh, the, uh, the baby bees, and they'll do that for a week, and then they become comb builders. I gotta put my phone away, my wife is calling. <laughs> they are busy. Oop, let me go back. And then after that, they become guardian bees. So, so they'll be hanging out at the front entrance and making sure that uh, other bees from other places, other hives don't come in there, or wasp or yellow jackets. Uh, if a skunk comes along, they are ready to sting. So, um, so there's always guardian bees out in the front. And then, of course, somebody's got to get rid of the dead bees. The girls have to do that too. They'll, they'll take the little funeral ser service and kick them out the front, front of the hive. And then the last part of the, their life is foraging. They go out there and they're picking up the nectar and the uh, pollen and, um, and bringing it back to, to help feed the re rest of the colony. So that all happens in five weeks. And then, they're, then they die. <laughs> so it's a very short life. So that's probably why there's so many bees in a single thing. 30,000 bees and about between 1,000 to 1,500 bees will die each day. So guess what that makes the queen? Very, very busy. <laughs> so she's got to lay about 1,500 to 2,000 eggs each day. So, so the queen, we'll talk about her, but she's uh, pretty, pretty busy. So this is the, uh, the boy bee, uh, that lazy guy that's just sitting in there watching TV. Um, he basically is there to mate with the queen. There's only one queen in a hive, and, so, uh, and that queen only mates one time in, in her life's, lifespan. But uh, he is there ready, and usually I said there's 30,000, or 90% are girls, and so there's 30,000 bees, so there's about 3,000 male bees in there just kind of hanging around waiting waiting and hoping that they can mate with the queen. Um, oop, speaking to the queen. This thing goes back. There we go. Um, so they're all there um, during the summer, ready to go in case they lose a queen. Queen could get sick, or uh, the rest of the girl bees make the decision if that queen is not good, they're going to kill the queen and, and make a new queen. So. But only one queen to a hive, and she lives about four years. Um, but the other thing about the drones, I, actually I got a good picture of the drone here, is at the end of the year, toward uh, October, September, throughout that time, the girl bees are saying, this guy's wasting all our energy here, and we're gonna, it's getting cold out. Um, they kick him out. They say, we're done with you. They don't, they don't need the boy bees and the queen's not gonna mate during the winter time. So they kick the boys out and they die. So they've got a pretty short life themselves. And, but uh, again, the decision of the girls, they say, you're out of here. A <laughs> um, Couple other things that you can tell a boy bee, a drone, is he's got these real giant eyes. Um, uh, you can kind of see it there. They're, they're just oversized eyes that, uh, when you look at them and saying, oh, that's it. And he's also about, he's, he's not so long, but he's kind of fat and chunky, have, has a square bottom, and he has no stinger. So he's really dependent on the girl bees to protect him. So um, when I do field classes or take, take bees to the school kids and things, I'll, I'll bring out some boy bees because they can't sting. 
they, they'll crawl all over the kids and they won't sing because they, they can't. <laughs> so very dependent, I got, I'll pass this around. Very be dependent on uh, the, the girl's bees to protect the boy. And he pretty much stays in the hive because they're not going to go out unless the queen's out and that's the only time they'll be flying out. So let's talk about the lovely queen. Um, she has a great big abdomen. And with my picture here, you can see there's a, these are worker bees. This is a queen right here. She's got this real big abdomen because she's got to lay 1,500 eggs <laughs> a day. And so she's just going and going and going. Um, she's, if you look, her, her wings are actually the same size as a regular, regular bee there. But uh, just that real large abdomen. She, when I'm looking in the hive and looking for the queen, that's what I see is that big old queen with a long body out there. So she lives about between two to four years. Four is pretty much the maximum. Um, and it's, a, again, it could be just a couple years and then the, the girls will say, she's not doing such a good job. Off with her head. <laughs> um, so they, they may kill her themselves and, and, and try to, they'll build a new queen. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about the queen. Um, it's the same kind of system. They, 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 in day three, the, the egg hatches. Um, it's a little bit shorter than a regular bee where it takes 21 days. A queen from that big egg, egg in the, the cell to uh, coming out of the hive is about 14 days. So, the, but all the worker bees are just really trying to feed her and, and trying to build up uh, the, 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 the queen itself. So, so they're giving her what we call royal jelly and uh, just stuffing her full of that and making, it, making her, giving her that extra long abdomen. Um, what determines who becomes a queen? Uh, the girls do. So um, we'll go on to this next one. So the girls will dis decide they need a new queen and they're gonna uh, take about six or seven regular B cells in, in there that they, the, the queen already laid, and then they're gonna start feeding them that, the royal jelly. So there'll be six or seven of the, these cells that are, look like little peanuts hanging down, and one of those gets to be a key, the queen. Um, the first one generally that comes out of that hive, boy, go back. Um, will become the queen, and the first thing that queen does is she'll go, go around to the other peanuts and kill the, the bees inside. So there's only one queen, and if two come out at the same time, there's a fight to the death. So, so there's only one queen, queen allowed. So swarming, I'm sure a lot of you have seen swarms of bees hanging out on a tree or, or under your eaves of your house or something like that. And well, if that happens, call the beekeepers. We'll take care of them. Uh, we, we get a, quite a few calls for people that uh, are just panicking because there's a swarm of bees in their backyard. And that's, that's a good news for us because those are free bees, a free beehive. So, so that's, whoop, let me go back. <clears throat> so, a lot, of, a lot of times it's, it's a sign of a healthy hive. So if my, my hive here is just growing and growing and growing, um, the, they're gonna decide to split on their own. They say, there's not enough room here, we're, we're overpopulating. So they'll take half the hive and they'll swarm out and try to find a new place to go. So they, uh, they'll do it on their own. Um, and usually I try to catch it before they, that happens, I can, when I open up my hives and say, whoa, they're exp <laughs> expanding like crazy, I can take uh, this box and make a new hive out of it just by putting it somewhere else. And then the, the girl, girls in there, as long as there's eggs inside the hive, they can make, give the, the, the royal jelly to the, uh, the queens themselves, or the new queens, the, those little peanuts, and develop a new queen that way. 
Royal jelly is some high nutrient that they go out and collect. It's, uh, I'm not sure what's all in it. Um, it comes from the plants, yeah. Oh, I mean a certain kind of plant, or is it? it it's a variety of things. So they'll, but they they'll mix it up. They'll with the nectar and whatever else they're bringing in there and mix it. And it, they kind of mix up what we call bee bee bread, and they'll okay, eat that. It's a mixture of different. Yeah, but it's just a, it has a lot of new nutrients that the other bees don't get. They give it to the queen. Yes, you can still do that. You can still do that. Okay. You can do that for me. Because <laughs> I develop my own creams. Just to assure, I mean, I just got the advice from somebody who was about the hive stroke. Is that just to assure that you have a queen? Yeah. The... Yeah, so sometimes uh, beekeepers, have, sometimes the bees that get in trouble. Um, you open the hive and suddenly you don't see a queen in there. And so um, a lot of people just say, well, we, we don't have enough eggs inside the hive to, to make a new queen, for them to make a new queen, so we'll go call a beekeeper that develops queens and, and uh, put a new queen in there themselves. And, and, and then a swarm, if you, if you go out to somebody's house and you get a swarm, then do you just hope that there's enough queen? Yeah, so the old queen will fly away with the, in that swarm. Oh. The new queen will stay or be be, be developed inside the, the, the original hive, and she'll become the new queen, but the old queen always flies away with the swarm. And so when I capture a swarm, there's always a queen bee inside. You've seen those pictures of people that have, they'll, they'll have a big beard of bees and things. You put the queen right here on their, their chin, and the bees will just gather around them. They're not really into stinging. They're more into keeping the queen warm and protected. Um, of course, if you swat them, they're going to try to sting. But um, the, the guys that do that, they're, they're just basically putting the, the queen on them and letting the bees fly and cover them. So, <laughs> yeah, kind of weird, but it, it works. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Google. <laughs> so there's different types of combs. Um, so this is basically um, what, what they make. It's pretty amazing that these are perfect hexag hexagons, and they make them out of wax. They develop them at wax. They've got a gland on their legs that they just pull sheaths of wax off to build build the uh, comb itself. It's pretty incredible. Um, but they use it for everything. They'll use this to put, of course, honey in it, but they also put their baby bees in there and, and uh, the, they'll develop the larvae and, and the cocoons in there. They store their pollen in there. Um, everything is this in their little, their homes. Oh, they'll go, she'll whatever, yeah, she'll just do, do a whole bunch. Yep, yeah, she'll be wandering around, she'll stop, put an egg in, and then wander another spot and stop, and it's a... Uh... Yeah, go ahead and, and feel it. If, don't worry about crushing it or anything, because the bees will make, make it up again, they fix it. They're, they're pretty good about reconstructing everything. So they'll put the cap in there. Oop, this thing, go, go. Um, ideally, on, on one of the hives, when um, there's a colony of bees in there, so what, what'll happen is they'll put honey on the sides, of, uh, uh, around the top of the sides, and they'll put the eggs right in the center of the, the, the frame itself. And so those worker bees that are working there, they'll just go over here and get the little bit of pollen or honey or whatever they need and get it back to the, the larvae that are, they're feeding. So 
a typical hive would have just kind of a, like a ring of honey and then bees in the center of it. Um, so on the picture there, they, they, you can see the kind of the gold, the honey itself. That is actually, we just call it nectar. Um, it's not really honey until the bees use their wings and cause evaporation. And when the, uh, the honey gets down to 17% of water in, in content, then it becomes honey and that's when they cap it over and, and store it for winter, basically. So, so that, that is a typical, typical capped honey, ready to go. Um, when it's like that, that's when I want to get my honey. I don't want to get the ones with the open cells because there's just too much water in there. Um, and the, the water content is where you could have some kind of spoilage and stuff. So a lot of beekeepers, if they take it early, they're not getting the proper amount of, uh, uh, for the honey. Um, so worker brood, worker brood, yeah. So these, these are typical, as I said before, the open cells is where the larvae goes in and then after uh, a few days, they'll cap it into that cocoon. There's that brood pattern again. You can see the honey on the edge there and then they put some pollen and then they, on the bottom part, that's where the eggs are being put in there. Um, another one, a little lighter, lighter comb. Same idea though. Drone, drones are, they're so big that they can't fit in a typical comb. And so they kind of build the comb out to, to make a big lump on the top of the, the, the wax comb that was already built. So I can tell when the mo where the boys are and <laughs> versus the girls. Heater bees, um, again that's, in the winter time, or coming into the winter, uh, they're going to build bigger bees. Fat, we call them fat bees because they're fatter. Fat in, in a bee will store more heat, and so that helps them get, them, get through the winter. So they're gonna, they tend to be a little bit bigger also on, on the cells, but um, it's a good time for, for the winter. Of course, there's the larvae again. And pollen cells, they come in almost any color. Whatever's blooming out there, I, I, I sit out in the front and watch what, what's coming in. Sometimes it's bright red, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes yeah, even blue colors that where the, whatever the pollen is that they like that they're getting, um, that's what they're going. It's a protein uh, that helps them uh, survive in there. They don't just live on honey. Um, yeah, we can go there. So you can see the different colors there and the varieties there. That's, that's all pollen that they're feeding their, their babies with. So again, the honey is a nectar that's taken from the flower. It's still, it's not honey until they actually, the bees will get in there and they'll flap their wings and cause the evaporation to, uh, to cause, uh, to come and then, well, it says 18%, I thought 17%, but it's a pretty low water content in honey. Propolis, that's another product that they bring in. It's tree sap, basically. They, uh, they'll go to the different plant, plants or, or the bark on the trees and they'll pull the sap off. It's a perfect glue. They, they will glue this whole hive closed to keep the, uh, the air from leaking in or out and, and keep them war warm. And so when I open up the hive, most of the time I really have to pull the top off because they, they really do a big deal there. Is that right? Okay. So bees start, 55 degrees is our day, our, our kind of our indicator of when the bees will be going out of the hive and foraging. It could be dead winter, December, January, and if the temperature goes above 55, they are out of the hive and they're looking for anything that they, they can bring back in, any pollen. And there's quite a few plants that, are, that have pollen in, in the winter time. Question, uh, temperature 55, is that like peak of the day, like 3 o'clock, or is it 55 overnight? 
Uh, no, the peak of the day, whatever the temperature, when they, they, they figure out, saying there must be somebody in there, a little weatherman or something in there, <laughs> weather girl, <laughs> and says, okay, it, the right temperature, go, get, go, go see what you can find. And, and so pretty much any time it turns 55, they're, they're out there. If there's snow on the ground and it's 55 degrees, they will go out and look. So, um, oh, I went way too forward here. Okay. Um, usually February, March is when uh, the, the family starts, the, the queen starts getting busy. She'll start laying some, uh, the boy bees, the drone eggs, and getting them ready, and, and will lay more worker bees and starting. So she stays dormant from pretty much September all the way to February just kind of staying there and trying to stay warm with her, her cluster of fat bees around her. Um, so the first thing they're going to do, is when, once that temperature gets up there, is they're gathering pollen, they're building up more honey storage, um, and then more sap for the propolis. So early spring, um, this time of year, uh, there's the, the almonds are really big out here. A lot of the beekeepers and me myself, I'm not taking my bees down to the almonds this year, but um, they pack up their, their hive boxes and take them to the almond orchards and let the bees just collect uh, pollen from down there and build up. And of course, all the almond growers are happy because they're going to get a lot of almonds out of it. Um, let me go back. So there's a variety of different plants that are happening this year. Um, pr pretty much into September. Um, and cherries, cherries are already blooming up here also, I noticed. So um, Ceanothus, there's a uh, rosemary starting to bloom and, and it's a little bit of time. So things, things happen early in the year and, and that makes the bees happy, as long as it's 55 degrees. <laughs> So as the hive grows, um, we kind of use an indicator. When I'm, I, I check my hives about every 10 to 14 days and look, in, look inside and see what's going on. Um, so if I've got one box, 30,000 bees in here, um, and just one box to start, uh, and they look like they're pretty packed out, there's 10 frames in one of these. I'm going to put this down because I keep pushing it. <laughs> so there's 10 frames in a box here. Um, when it looks like they've built like eight of those frames out with uh, honey and bees and pollen, it's time to put another box on. So um, I get that second box on and they'll start working on it, building it. Uh, and these, these frames here are just plastic on the inside. And so I will give them a blank frame with nothing on it and then they start building it up. In, into this nice honeycomb. So you always keep extra boxes? I uh, have lots of extra boxes, yep. So if I get, my, my whole goal is to, uh, for the, the year is, I'll start with one box, and by the end of summer, I'll have two boxes on here. Um, and sometimes um, it, uh, I'll be able to put a smaller box on there if, if they've built it out. So. Our rule basically is the bottom box is for the brood. That's where the colony is living for most of the year. The second box is food storage. So they're eating, they're building up this second box and uh, filling it out with honey and pollen and things like that. So they need that for the year. They need that to get through winter. Um, I'll, I'll try to make sure that I have um, a second box on there to get, get the, my bees through winter. and. They don't need anything. They don't need coats or anything. They keep everything inside the hive warm. But if they run out of food, they're in trouble. So I put a second box on there. If they build out that second box, that's their box. Our rule is never to take or steal their honey. That's for them. I'll put a third box on. You can see my, this box is a little bit smaller. It makes it easier to pick up because you can put a bunch, a bunch of these boxes on and they're about 40 pounds each. So 40 to 60 pounds of honey is a lot. But I'll put this on top and that's my honey. So 
Um, the more boxes I put up and the more they build up, that's, uh, the, each box will do about 10 pounds worth of honey, which is about five gallons worth. So, so if I get four or five of these things on top, uh, that's how much honey I'm gonna have. So. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the important thing. Um, again, I talk about swarms. That uh, um, it's just a natural way of uh, the the bees to increase their hives. So the same thirty thousand bees that are in the bottom box uh -huh. keep filling up as you add boxes. They just keep working harder and harder. And they do. They just <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so an artificial split is basically if I see my bees are about ready to swarm themselves, I can take that one of those boxes and make a new hive out of it. And so that's what we call an artificial split. So more plants in the spring. Um, a lot of the apple trees and the fruit trees are starting to bloom out. Um, Real important ones around here, the monkey flower, the lupin and vetch, um, those are real good, bee, good flowers for the bees here and the, the bees really love them. And coyote bush also is, is a good wild plant that, that's around here that they really thrive on. Um, so they're gonna, they build up their storage. Um, in the summertime, I can harvest my honey and uh, get it and sell it at my farm, so um, it's a good, good time for that. Uh, again, late summer, time to get those boys out of there. So there's all sorts of different plants that are blooming through the, the summer. Let's say I have a lavender farm and the bees like the lavender farm, um, but at the same time, I can't get true lavender honey um, because there's so many other things that are blooming at the same time, especially blackberry. They, they'll pick blackberry over lavender any, any day. And so, so um, but the bumblebees really like lavender. <laughs> they are all over it and that's one of their favorites. Is, uh, so I, I, I see tons of bumblebees on lavender. It is poisonous. It causes their wings to curl and so they can't fly. So the bees are pretty smart. They figure out that they're not supposed to eat that, but if they have nothing else, they'll go after the, the buckeye. There's, uh, I actually have a list of different um, plants on here too. Uh, there's flowers that are blooming, the coyote bush again blooming, and then tarweed and English lavender. Um, all blooms in the fall also. And in the fall, they would do the cedar trees. Uh -huh. And so the honey would be, they just, I think what they called it honeydew. The yeah. The, the honey would be almost like molasses. Yeah. So if you, if I harvest in the, the spring, it, it's real light honey. It's, it's really like a light golden color. But the ones that uh, I harvest in the fall or late summer, real dark. So. so even yeah, well they're, they're bringing some other different flowers in, but it's always, always a darker honey in the fall. So, and some people like it because of they, they, this higher, higher, higher nutrients and things. It's great for making mead. <laughs> So a lot of the one thing I, I try to do is I try to put some honeycomb. I'll pull honeycomb from other hives and put it in there. And that scent of the, the comb is enough to draw them into there. But, but there's only one queen to the hive. Right. So what's going to cause them to leave and go over there where the comb is? There's no that's, that's me. <laughs> I, I'll take... Um, some of the frames that, that has 
the open brood in it, some eggs in it, and I'll take those and put them there with the worker bees that are on that frame, and the worker bees will say, we have no queen. What do we do? Let's make a new one. And so they'll, they'll, they'll actually make their own queen. But the worker bees that are inside, they just don't fly around. Um, the, the first part of the, their life, they're inside the hive, so they're not out flying around. So when I pull those bees out and put them in a, another hive, they're going to stay with that, whatever the frame that I put them in. And they say, okay, we suddenly lost our queen, and, and they'll make a new one. And when I'm making queens, that's kind of what I'm doing too. I'm kind of m making a false sense for them and they're, uh, the, the bees that are in my um, incubator, basically, is they're, they're saying, we have no queen, let's make some new queens. And so they'll make a bunch of them and then I'll take those queens and sell them <laughs> to other beekeepers. <laughs> so... A few plants out in the wintertime. Manzanita is a big one this, this time of year for, uh, for the bees. It, it has a lot of good pollen and they can pull the nectar off that also and bring it in on those above 55 degree days. Um, Dutch and pipe mine and, and rosemary. So these are the toxic ones. And there's, there's quite a few. Um, but they tend to know what ones. Azalea is a big one too. They're they're not good for bees. So, but the bees tend to stay away from it. If they are bringing some in, they're they're probably bringing other things in there too, just to to counter it. But um, those are pretty toxic toxic for the bees. Not to say you can't plant them. <laughs> they're good plants. They're pretty, especially azaleas and rhododendrons. So. Bees can travel up to five miles to find what they're looking for or if they're foraging, they'll go five miles around. And so I could, I'm not, I'm about five miles from here from my, my farm. So they could come over here if they found something good and, uh, and pick it up and take it back. But they'll, generally they'll stay within two, a two mile radius of the, the place. Uh, when they do find something they really if the bees are out foraging and they find something really good, that bee will come back and you've heard of the waggle dance. That waggle dance is really important for them that they'll get in there and that's how they give the directions to that, their source and, and, and they, they know where to go from there. Oh, well, it's doing it on your, I wasn't touching it either. <laughs> um, so they've kind of changed this rule about the specifically labeling um, honey. I, we used to, I, my first crop of uh, lavender, I put lavender honey and, and said, well, I don't have two miles of honey. So uh, the Federal Trade Commission says, no, you can't do that. Um, but they've kind of changed the rules if, if it's a, now they say if it's a substantial amount of product, uh, you, can, you can label it that way. So, so I got 4,000 plants. I could call it lavender honey, but it tastes more like blackberry honey to me. <laughs> um, and that is what I have there. Um, we're the El Dorado Beekeepers. Um, we're a club. There's about 150 of uh, local beekeepers around that are part of our club. Uh, we meet every second Sunday of the month at the community center. So. Yes, okay. So there was a downfall about six to eight years ago um, with the, the numbers of bees just totally disappearing. And I have had them in my eyes too. I'd, I'd get them to wintertime and they'd all be gone and going, I did everything right and they're gone. Um, so a lot of it had to do with the weather and the, uh, the di difference in climates and things like that that was ha happening. But most of it was from a little tiny mite that was brought in from uh, Asia um, and got into the bees here. It looks like a little tick, but it's, uh, 
very, it's hard to see because it's a size that it'll fit on the back of a, a bee and uh, basically suck out its organs out and kill it. Um, and that was happening a lot with the bees. Um, well, there, there has been. There's been a lot of science going and looking at it. Um, and they're, they've come up with different treatments. So I treat my bees uh, about four times a year. I'll, I'll test and um, I, I, I kill about 100 bees out of, out of 30,000. So the, the 100 bees will sacrifice themselves to, for me to test them. Um, I put them in alcohol and I can see the little mites and if I have a low number, then, then I don't have to treat. But if, it's, if I find six mites in my 30,000 bees, I will treat them and, and, and get, do a chemical treatment. It's not really, a, I'm an organic farm, so I have to watch on what kind of chemicals I use, but um, I basically ha use a chemical called oxalic acid. Um, it comes from the oxalis plant. So, so I figure that's pretty organic itself, uh, that I can at least treat the bees. Um, there are also scientists that are working on um, make, building colonies that will actually, um, the bees will kill or pull off the uh, mites themselves and, and do it that way. And there, there's some good successes in uh, the, the, they're making queens that can develop those kind of bees, so. Yeah, they're such kids. Yeah. But there's, there's another mite over in Asia that we're afraid that's gonna come over again and we're gonna have the same kind of problem. But, so it never ends. <laughs> that was colony collapse, yeah. Yeah, there really, nobody really knew what colony collapse was, was but um, most of it was because of this varroa mite that was going around. They are pretty random, but uh, they'll tend to avoid them. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you'll, yeah, if you look out on the uh, the uh, the dogwoods or the the, um, the other ones there, you could probably see a couple bees that are going around and, and bringing it in. But generally, they they try to avoid it. We, we do a lavender festival at the end of the two, last two weekends in June, and that's when we open up the farm. So, so we, we pretty much are, we don't even, we, I used to do pumpkins and I'd be open for that too, but uh, we're, I'm waiting for my apple trees now to grow so I can open in the fall for that. But, but right now, all I'm opening is in two weeks in June. And, I'm a retired guy, so I'm trying to stay retired and not work too hard. <laughs> what is mealy moth? Mealy moth? Um, I, I know different moths. We have a wax moth that goes into the hives, um, which they thrive on the wax of the, the honey, bee, bees' wax, and they become a problem. But I don't really, I don't know if that's the same as a mealy moth or not, but. I don't know. We lost all our hives and they told us mealy moth. Yeah, it's probably the wax moth. Um, when, it's, when it starts warming up, uh, they, they, if, the, the hive, if the hive is strong, uh, the bees will keep the, wa the wax moth out of there. But if it's a weak hive, the, the wax moths will come in there and they'll just do all sorts of damage to the, the hive, the, each frame of the hives. So. Is it blue moon, your farm? A oh, bluestone meadow. Blue meadow. Pretty close. <laughs> Is there a demand? Yeah, like Seems a, like it. <laughs> I got a lot of people calling and asking if they could, we could bring hives to their farm and things like that. And so, um, so there's, there's a lot. And plus, like the almond orchards, there is companies all the way from Pennsylvania. They'll they'll bring thirty thousand hives to California to to f take care of the almond orchards, and. Um, and each one of those, they pay about $300 per hive. So there's some big money for, for renting your hive to the almond orchards. And same with uh, Florida, the oranges, they do the same thing. So these guys will take their big trucks and have all their thousands of hives on there, take them into the almond orchards. When they're done there, they'll 
put them back in the truck and drive them all the way to Florida and do it again and wherever else they need to go. So it's, it's a big business. I'm going to leave that to Jana. She's going to talk about that. Oh, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> okay. If the female bee nests for about three to five weeks and the queen lives two to four years, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, the, well, to start with, they, they have to start with a, a queen. So when I'm getting, if I bought a package of bees, which you can actually order them and get them in the mail <laughs> with a queen in it, and, and then I could start with a, basically a queen and about, oh, about 12,000 bees and then start giving them a little bit of sugar water to help. Yeah, I use sugar water also in the wintertime just to kind of supplement. So the, um, if it's a, a weeks of rain or something, I can give them a little bit of sugar water and that'll kind of keep them from eating their, all their honey up for the winter time. But uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll give the, that package of bees some sugar water to let them build up some wax and then they'll, they'll do it all by themselves. The queen will start laying eggs and go from there. So it's like the chicken, the egg of the chicken type thing. You need to have one or the other. Yep. I'll, Neonicotoids, uh, Roundup. It's not a good thing. <laughs> um, basically, the bees will, when the flowers are pollinating, they'll take the neonicotoids into the hive and it can, can t contaminate, basically. So we're, we're very careful about Roundup and uh, the, the products that, uh, around there. Uh, and pesticides? It, and pesticides, yes. So, <laughs> Yep, there's other ways to farm that you don't have to kill all the grass and things around there. The, the other critters need it. <laughs> so I should let Jenna take over here. Thank you so much. <laughs> you got it. So I want you to start with this flower. And I know I was here to tell you about what bees like and what you can do for bees. But to do that, I really need to tell you a little bit more about bees. Not that John didn't tell you a lot. But we're going to start with this. Now, you guys live up here, so you probably have seen pollen on your car, that yellow pine pollen. Well, luckily for us, most grains like wheat, rice, corn, they are pollinated by the wind, just like that pine tree. But we have an almond blossom here. Pretend it's an almond blossom, OK? In the very throat of that is where this flower produces nectar. And nectar is energy for bees to fly. He told you they take in some into their own stomach and then they have a crop stomach which they take back home. And they pass that to the next bee. And that becomes part of their water source. And it goes to the next bee and the next bee and the next bee. And eventually it gets put into one of those little cells and it will then be fanned by their wings to help dehydrate it. So yes, honey is bee spit. Yes, spit it from one bee to the next bee to the next bee, okay? But the guy who went out for it, he was hungry, and so he got the nectar. But at the top of the, well, in there is the little long arms. We know those are stamen, right? At the top of that's called an anther. It's a little fist. Now, if it's a pine tree, that fist is open. But if it's an almond, that fist is closed tight. The wind can blow. The rain can come down. That pollen is not leaving that anther. And yet, it has to leave that anther and go not just to another almond blossom. It has to go to a different variety almond tree in order to make it happen. And it has to happen within five days of that blossom opening. So timing is really important. Enter Barbie. <laughs> okay. Now, it looks like she only has one pair of wings, right? Totally false. Honeybees have two pairs of wings, but they have initial Velcro, little comb teeth on the back of the front wing and the front of the back wing, and they look to hook together so that they have a bigger wing. Because look at this bee. It's a fat bee. It's the little wings. If I was a butterfly, I'd have big wings, little body. I could do this, right? 
the big hand. The next time you're going to look at a fly and you're going to swat it, check it out. Those wings extend past the end of the body. More wing, less body. Not on the bee. So two things happen. One, a bee's wings are attached differently than almost any other accent. Insect, excuse me. They're not attached to the back like it looks. The muscles come around to the front, both from the back and the front, one for each set of wings, and they move by twitching. I want you to think about when you shiver. Can you possibly shake as fast as you shiver when you're really, really cold? You can't. That's twitch muscle. That's how bees fly. Turns out a bee's wings can beat 260 beats in a second. Let me give you a correlation there. A ladybug, 80 beats in a second. Huge difference, right? Well, what happens when those beat like this is that they vibrate enough to open up the anther in the almond. So bees are absolutely critical to almonds. California has about 1.5 million acres in almonds right now. That's bigger than El Dorado County. Figure it takes two hives, that's the bottom layer only, 20 to 30,000 bees per acre, two hives. Works out to be 80 billion bees in California this month. 75 to 80% of all the hives in the United States will be trucked to California for the almonds. Partly because almonds contain the 10 amino acids that bees need. And they're one of the earliest blossoms that will support a bee. So we truck all these bees in. They do it at night when it's cooler and cold, so the bees are more likely to stay in their hive. Then they take the big screens off of them, and they let them accumulate for about two weeks before the blossoms really come out, so they're kind of used to the area. They're getting warmer, and then they start to fly. And because it beats its wings, it gets pollen dropping when it went in really to get the nectar. I've already lost my flower, but it really was going after the nectar. But it caused the pollen to fall. Well, what happens to the pollen? OK, we're going to pretend we're all average humans. We have about 100,000 hairs on our head. I'm getting older. I don't have as many. <laughs> little b, right? Little b. How many hairs do you think it has? Yeah, Three million oh. on a bee. They are spaced a pollen with the part, and they even have hairs on their eyes. They are totally set up to grab that pollen. They don't mean to exactly. They're going after the nectar, but they get encased in pollen. And fortunately, they have legs that are built right for that prospect. Like he said, the back legs have baskets on them that they can roll the pollen into a ball and stick it in the baskets. Sometimes you'll see them look like they have orange basketballs hanging on them. The front legs are intended with little combs on the back of them. If you look really close, you'll see comb-like things on the front legs only so they can swipe the pollen off their body and put it into a ball they spit in it a little more nectar to get it to stick, and then they put it in their balls and carry it. A bee will carry 30% of its body weight in pollen. I want you to think about this. You're a gardener, right? You've got your 130 pounds. That means a 50-pound bag of fertilizer. Take it out of the car, carry it to the backyard, put it down, and go get it again. And oh, by the way, the car is two miles, maybe five miles, two is more common, but two miles away. That's a pretty strong bee, right? Pretty impressive. Okay, so now we have this list. And I want to talk to you about the list a little bit, and then we're going to talk more about the bee, because if you understand how bees work, you'll know what to plant, okay? This list starts with, well, places you can go. IPMUCANR.edu. I want you to know the part that says UCANR.edu. If you ever have an agricultural question and you don't want to contact the Master Gardeners, which is an easy thing to do, El Dorado County has Master Gardeners, and we will answer any question you ask us about gardening. Won't be the same day, but it will happen. But we are part of the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources Department. 
and they maintain a website that includes all the results of all the different research studies all those grad students ever did, you can find out anything. Our favorite part of it is called integrated pest management. And we're really in favor of that concept because it says don't use so many pesticides, don't use so many herbicides, try integrated pest management. So that's my number one tune to tout. You talked about the neonicotinoids. Comes from neo being nude, new, nicto from the nicotine tree. Almost no insect will touch a nicotine tree. About 10 years ago, when you went to Home Depot, it would say on it, treated with neonicotinoids. It's a systemic, it goes into the ground when the plant is very young. It's carried in that plant forever. And what happens with bees, it doesn't affect the bee itself that flies back to the thing, but it's in the pollen, it gets in the bee bread, it gets fed to the pupa stage, and the bee's brain does not develop the same if it's been treated with that. So we believe this is like having Silent Spring published in the 60s. It took 20 years to get rid of DEET. We think that we're gonna go for that. Unfortunately, agricultural has lots of money. So what you can do, shop at nurseries and say, I want organic plants. I think my first thought was, I'm buying a plant, it is organic. <laughs> no, if they've treated it with a systemic fertilizer or a systemic pesticide, that plant is contaminated the rest of its life, okay? So let's talk a little bit about pesticides. Pesticides are not chocolate chip cookies. More is not better. Follow the directions on the herbicide or the pesticide label. If it says three tablespoons per gallon, trust it. That's the right amount to kill it with the least damage to other insects, other plants, other whatever. Extra chocolate chips don't make it better. <laughs> no. Okay. Going on down here, UC Davis, tin bees, tin plants. I'm showing you this one because in addition to giving you the tin plants, which I've listed here, they also show you pictures of native bees. And that's a little bit I want to talk about. He talked about honeybees. Honeybees are not native to the United States. They were imported. They came across in wagons, they came in the ships, not native. We have 1,600 native California bees, we have 4,000 native US bees. The bees developed along with the native plants. So regardless of what this list says, if you're gonna go buy a plant and you wanna support bees, buy a native plant. UC Berkeley did a study. They had lots of grad students. They sent them out into the UC Berkeley area. They had a thousand plants they identified in front yards, backyards, what have you, and they checked them over a period of time. I don't know how long. Out of those thousand plants, only 50 were native. At the end of the study, 80% of all the bees observed were on the 50 plants. That means 80% of the bees on 5% of the plants. And the only thing they had in common, they were native. So regardless of what the list says, buy native. Good choice. OK. So now, what plants on the list are native? I'm sorry? What plants on the list are native? Well, not that many. What else? Yeah. Truthfully, not that many. Ceanothus, Ceanothus is a good choice. Um, poppies are a good choice. The list is intended for things that you would put in your yard and people traditionally like and are available in nurseries. Native plants often are not available in nurseries. We are really lucky here. Elderberry Farms is down in Sacramento, about Rancho cordova -ish. They sell native plants. Um, we have a native plant society here that sells both in the spring and the fall. Unfortunately, because of COVID, you have to go online to order your plant and then you come and pick it up. But the reason the lists show you nursery plants is because the others are hard to get, but it's worth it. If you want bees, go native. Some nurseries will have a small section dedicated to the California native plants also. 
Absolutely. And I encourage you to go to that nursery and shop there and tell them, I'm buying a native plant and I only want organic plants. Okay? Is the native plant nursery in Lotus still exist? I do not know the answer to that. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Nurseries tend to turn over a lot. Okay. Because that plant did not develop when that pollinator developed. Remember I told you, native plants and native bees develop together. Okay. We talk about honeybees because they are the only insect that produces a product people can eat. And they're willing to live in managed scenarios. Native bees are solitary. You could never get 20,000 of them together. You, the only native bee we have that sort of goes together, bumblebees. And bumblebees will get colonies of about two or 300. Only the, the queen lives through the winter. And so she doesn't need much honey. Bumblebees actually do produce some honey, but we don't count it because it's just enough to get the queen through the winter. Do native bees intermingle with honeybees? No. Do they have honeybees? They don't like another? No. Yeah. no. Remember he mentioned about guard bees? Honeybees know the smell of their bees. And if a bee from a different hive, correct me wrong, comes into this hive, the guard bees are going to kick it out. It's not their bee, let alone a native bee. So I have some pictures here I'll send around so you can get some ideas of what native bees might look like because you'll be surprised. They don't look like honey bees. Pass those around. Going back to our list, it's easier for you to look things up and see what your nursery might have. So I've given you references. Pollinator.org is a fabulous website. You put in your zip code. It will know exactly what zone you're in. It will give you plants that will go not just with bees, but other pollinators. Bats are pollinators. Birds are pollinators. Your dog is actually a pollinator if it's running through a field because it's going to pick up pollen and it's going to put it someplace else. And that's what a pollinator is. Okay? Xerces.org is an outstanding website with fabulous information, including lists that will help you figure out what you want to plant. It'll help you decide shade, sun, whatever. Great resource. The pollinator.org's best list is here for you in case you don't want to get on the internet. UC Davis's top 10 is based on actual experience down at Davis, which isn't that far from here. Most of their plants will do well for us. Um, I'm sorry? And the last one is the almond experiment, which is kind of interesting. Somebody spoke about colony collapse, which happened between 2007 and 2008. Well, when all the bees died, people decided we should research bees. And surprisingly, there had been not much research. People had been raising bees. Well, there was honey in the oldest Egyptian tomb. Okay, so 5,000 years of raising bees, but not a lot of research done. Colony collapsed, and suddenly money was contributed to do it. UC Davis expanded its bee haven. Um, Harry and David, that's the wrong one. And ice cream guys, Hagen dust? And, and Jerry. No, this is Hagen dust. Anyway, they put in a lot of money. The almond group put in tons of money because they needed bees. So they did an experiment to see what plant could they put at the end of the almond orchards in order to attract the most bees and give bees other things to do besides almonds? Because, you know, you can live on McDonald's day after day after day after day. You can live on it. Bees can live on almonds alone. But if you give them something else, they do better. So they put those plants, the ones listed here, out because their experience had told them those will be the best choices. And let me tell you what it showed. It showed that native bees and honeybees don't necessarily like the same thing if they're given the same choices. Out of that list, cat mint was the best for the honeybees. Next was, it's, here it's called turkium, it's gerrymander to you and I. 
Great choice. Honeybees loved it. And the last one was the Russian sage, the Pavosky. Conversely, the, um, the native bees, their favorite was, I've lost it, there, aster. And here it's listed as Symphonarticium. That's aster. Native bees loved it. Okay, well, let's talk about the difference between those shapes of those and what they have in common. First off in common, those are all kind of in the pink and purple range. And that's because we're going to talk about bees' eyes. Big compound eyes, right? See how they fit mostly around the body? A bee can see 280 degrees. It sees a lot. A bee can detect color five times faster than you and I. But it doesn't see every color. It does not see red at all. No reds. But it sees ultraviolet that you and I don't see. It really likes blues and purples because that's the high point of its sight range. So pick blues and purples and your odds are good. Okay. The other thing neat about this, this compound eyes are seeing a thousand pictures at a time. Well, when that happens, you see motion really fast. It is seeing motion 30 times faster than you and I. It sees it in 1 300th of a second. That means that if you plant flowers that move, you're going to attract more bees. Okay, so we're going to pick purple, ultraviolet. We're going to pick ones that move. Those will be better. See these little guys on the end here? We're pretending those are antlers. That's not the right word. Antenna. Okay. They can articulate and they smell. They smell with their antenna. They like things that smell sweet and light. So if you have a dead something or it smells deadish, you might attract a bat and that's a pollinator, but you're not going to attract a bee. So when you're in the nursery and you're looking for something and you want it to be for bees, if it floats, that's great. If it's blues and purples, that's fabulous. And it should smell good. And it's going to be a bee attractor. Pretty cool, huh? OK, what else do we have to talk about on our list? Ah, how they fly. OK, so bees, remember they did their little thing? They're kind of, well, I won't say they're lazy, but they want to they're op opportunistic. So if you have a choice of this flower, and then there's this flower, and then there's that flower, or you have a raceme of flowers, like on a Russian sage or a lavender, how much easier for a bee? It's going to go this one, that one, that one, that one, that one. So pick flowers that have lots of flowers on the same stalk. Much better choice. Bees will be happier. If you were a honeybee, you like tubular flowers. That cat mint, right? It's, it's little, but it's a little tube. Okay, They fit inside of it. If you're a native bee, you like flat flowers. The aster, much flatter, right? Consistently across the board. Honeybees like tubes. Native bees tend to like flatter flowers. So what you're looking for can impact what you choose. If you choose navy, native plants, it's always good. OK. The next thing I want to talk to you about is timing. He gave you great lists of flowers. Right now, you go out, and there's not as much out there as you'd hope, right? My newest favorite I want you to write down, I want you to try to find this one. It's called Winter Honeysuckle. It is on the all-star list, meaning that it is relatively drought tolerant, and it requires virtually no care at all. I read the 55 degrees. I believe the 55 degrees. I was in the Sherwood Demonstration Garden in January. It was only 50 degrees. Winter Honeysuckle covered in bees, absolutely covered. So if you have no other plant out of this one, Find that one. It only grows about this tall. It's about this big around. It's blooming right now. It has the sweetest, delicate smell. You'll just love it. Is it native? No. <laughs> no. But it's a great choice, and it's no work. Um, 
and it fills a spot, you know? It kind of rounds itself out. No big work. Absolutely. Um, we will open March 3rd for our first day for the year. We're open on Friday and Saturday mornings from 9 until noon. There's a docent that can show you around, or you can just take a map and walk. We've got 16 different gardens, including a native garden. We have a spot bee garden. Doesn't look very good right now. <laughs> but the all-star garden is not far away, and that's the one that's covered in bees. Okay. No, this is at Sherwood Demonstration Garden in Placerville. It, it's adjacent to Folsom Lake College off of Missouri Flat, Green Valley Road? Green Valley Road. Behind Indian Creek. So okay, behind Indian Creek, um, next to the observatory. Yeah. And it's free and we really welcome you to come. In fact, anytime you're thinking about putting something in your garden, you can go on our website and see if we've already got it. And if we do, you can go look to see how big is it gonna get you can ask us how much work it is to take care of it. We'll tell you. And will you be having your sales this year? We will. We're, um, we are nine weeks away from our vegetable sale, and we are 11 weeks away from our non-vegetable sale. OK. Am I doing OK? I'm good. Fine. OK, so now I've told you about the bees' wings, and I've told you about the eyes, and those two factors should help you know that you want Blue and purple flowers, lots of little flowers, smells good. Okay, what else can I tell you? Well, let me tell you about things that are on the list. When you plant your garden for bees, plant it so that you can see them. You know this part, right? Small things in the front, medium, and then tall. And put it in the sun. But for a bee to be happy, it needs about nine square feet. You want to be about three by three worth of flower of the same kind. It doesn't have to be in that space, but you know, one here and one there and one there is okay in your yard, but you need that many of the same thing to really attract the bee. Okay? Second, bees want water. Believe it or not, even though that nectar had water in it, bees want water, but they are lousy swimmers just pitiful. So if you have a bird bath, consider putting a rock in it or make sure it's got really slanted sides so the bee has some place to land that's dry and can get a drink. Everybody who has a pool knows bees don't swim and you gotta pull them out of there. If you give them some place that they can land and drink, they will be so much happier. So we're gonna give them food. We're not gonna give them pesticides. If we do, we're gonna follow the directions Oh, and I forgot to tell you, when you're using an herbicide, if it has a flower, you have to pull it. If you have, let's say you've got weeds, 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 and none of them are in bloom, I'm not going to listen and spray them. But now you waited too long, and the dandelion has come out, it's a flower. If you like bees, you cannot spray it. You have to pull it. So if you're gonna use an herbicide, timing is important. Do it before things bloom. Because after they bloom, you're just killing his whole thing. Not fair. No. Okay, so we did pesticides, we did timing. We did a three, three by five, or three, three, three by three patch, but it doesn't all have to be in the same spot. So, you know, set your cans out and go, okay, that's big enough, now I can put them anywhere in my yard. We gave them water. Nesting. Okay, honeybees are going to go back to the hive. They don't go anywhere else. Native bees are a whole different category. We typically categorize native bees by how they nest. So we talk about mason bees, we talk about digger bees. Bumblebees are their own category. Carpenter bees, they're called that because they drill holes in wood to make their nests. Okay, lots and lots of bees, maybe as many as 60% of the native bees are digger bees or ground bees. They may use somebody else's hole, they may make their own hole. So in your yard, when you have a space and you just haven't gotten to it, you just tell everybody, that's for nesting bees. 
Likewise, if you have weeds that get away from you and they're flowering, you just say, the bees love it. Gardening can be easy. You just have to have reasons for what's going on. <laughs> okay, my timer says I'm almost out. So let me give you a few more things. Most native bees don't have stingers. Um, you specifically ask about mason bees. I'm gonna tell you about mason bees and partly because I'm gonna tout something. As master gardeners, we try not to talk about stores or certain products or what have you, but this is such a cool thing. We now have rent a bee, okay? It's not hives, there are mason bees. Mason bees are called that because mason as in bricklayer mason. So let me tell you about the mason bee. In the spring, weather gets warm, the boy bees come out. They were in a little tube where their mom put them. About three days later, the girl bees come out. They mate, and then the girl bee begins her entire life, which is no more than six weeks long. She goes out to a flower, she gets pollen, she comes back to a tube. It's probably not the same one that she was in. Could be a hollow tube from a reed, it could be a tube that you drilled into a two by four, about a quarter of an inch wide and about three inches long. And she builds this pollen ball. She mixes nectar and bee spit and pollen. She makes a whole ball. She lays one egg on top of it. And then she goes to get some mud. And she, like a brick mason, builds a little wall between that egg and the next space. She makes another pollen ball, and then she lays another egg. She does this over her entire life, which is no more than six weeks, and she may have laid between seven and 11 eggs. The last two or three or four will all be boys. She decided that. The others will be girls. That way the boys will come out first. Inside that, that little egg will sit for about five days, and it'll hatch and now it looks like a grain of rice, maybe smaller than a grain of rice. It's tiny, it's got a mouth, and that's it. It eats that pollen ball. Five times it will shed its skin, it's called an instar, and it'll be a bigger grain of rice. No different though, it's just a white grubby looking little thing, tiny. After the fifth one, it'll spin a cocoon and it goes into its pupa stage. And now it's gonna take a longer time. And it's gonna turn into a bee. In this case, my case, a blue orchard bee. Okay, that'll take it till eh, August, East, September, somewhere in there. And now it's just gonna sit. That's it. It sits through the entire winter. It doesn't eat anymore. It doesn't do anything. It waits for it to get warm. And when it gets warm, the boys will fly. A few days later, the girls will fly, and they will go out and they will collect pollen and do the exact same thing again someplace else. Well, if you rent a bee, you'll get a block that has all those little eggs already in it, and they're already formed bees. They're waiting for it to get warm, and they will, this spring, fly away. UC Davis had, has contracted with rent a bee, which is out of Washington State, and if you rent a bee, they will contact you and ask if they can come and check your bees. And twice they'll come out to see what your bees are eating because we are now doing studies on native bees. And blue orchards are native bees. You can also sign up to get leaf cutter bees, which are similar, but they don't happen until like Augusty time frame. So pretty cool, huh? Okay. No, sheep. Okay, meat bees are the common name for yellow jackets. Obnoxious little critters. They do not pollinate them. Yucky. But speaking about those, the bad thing about those is that they like to sting. Most native bees don't have a stinger. Honey bees do, but they will not sting you unless they are trapped. Okay, so don't be stupid. Don't trap them. If you do and you get stung, you won't. You guys are all smart, you'll never do that. But you might come across someone who was stupid and got stung. 
Whatever you do, don't grab that stinger and pull it out. Attached to that stinger is a sac. I'm going to call it venom, but it's some kind of something that's not going to be happy in your body. If you grab it and squeeze it to pull it out, you will release it into you. So I want you to take your thumbnail or credit card and I want you to push it from the inside out so that you never, you never squish that pack until it was out of your hand, okay? Okay, so if I told you nothing else, that was it. Let me tell you one other exciting thing. If you decide you want to study bees, they are cold sensitive. So you take a net and you swoop it up and you might have to sacrifice a flower, it's okay. You stick it into a plastic jar or glass jar with a lid on it and put it in the refrigerator. 20 minutes, not more than that, okay? 20 minutes, you bring it out and now you've got two to three minutes that you can look at that bee up close and he won't do anything. Unscrew the lid and he'll fly away. Okay. You mentioned a minimum time for bees to get out and pollinate. Minimum temperature of 55 degrees. Is there a maximum temperature uh, that they will not exceed? No. Okay. No. Okay? Yes? These bees also look like flies. They don't look like bees. Well, and they yeah, the picture's going around. They don't look like it. But be careful when you say mason bees. Um, to talk about a bee is often to say that dog is black, that one is brown, that one is yellow. There are mason bees. They're described that way because of how they mailed their houses. Digger bees are in the ground, okay? So blue orchard bees do look like flies. And there's a picture running around, I think, of one. Um, the bees that you're going to see most often are bumblebees, big, and carpenter bees. I did not think they were bees. They're solid black. They're shiny. They don't look like they have any hair on them. They are lousy pollinators. Bumblebees are better pollinators than honeybees. They fly twice as much, probably because they have so much weight that they have to collect more stuff. So flower for flower, a bumblebee will hit far more than a honeybee. But a carpenter bee, he's got that really strong jaw because he can cut stuff. He says, forget the flower. I'm just going to the bottom of the tube. I'm drilling a hole, sucking out the nectar. I'm not pollinating diddly. Yeah, they, they do pollinate. I see them on my lavender a lot, but they are known as the thieves. Okay, can I answer any more questions? Sorry. Oh, yes, uh, I've enjoyed your presentation greatly. Thank you for coming. But I have a question. Uh, you mentioned I do have some where I see butterflies on them. Um, lavender. Yeah. I have butterflies on my lavender. Um, when you go to this Xerces org, I think it's that one, or it's the pollinator. Oh, it's the pollinator.org. They have a special section on butterflies. What attracts them? What attracts birds? What attracts bats? I never thought of bats as being pollinators, but they're really good about it. Okay. Thank you so much.